Welcome, everybody. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we're going to get started in before it's too late. Whoa. This is very wobbly. Can you hit me in the back? Yes? Are you sure? Okay. We had some mic trouble earlier. Yeah. See? Okay, welcome everyone to the third and final night of our MFA reading series to 2019-2020. We're very excited to have Wendy C. Ortiz here. Uh, before she comes up, I have some people to thank. I'm Dave Madden, I'm the uh, academic director of the MFA program here. Um, oh, uh, if you have not yet silenced your cell phone, I will remind you to do that. Don't be the person who forgets. Um, okay, so uh, some people to thank tonight. This night's made possible by the Dean's Office of the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, also, special thanks to Kimberly Garrett in the MFA office <laughs> for all her help in putting this together. Also, our Administrative Director, Micah Ballard, who's hiding in the back. Thanks to him as well. Um, Beth Yen, who's been a host and a lot of organizing of the event tonight. Thank you, Beth. And finally, you may have seen that in the corner here in the back, we have the USF bookstore that has copies of Wendy's two books. So please make sure you stop by there. Wendy will be happy to sign your copy. Um, at least I'm assuming that she would be happy to sign your copy. Oh, she'll do it. We, she, we, we'll make it. Whether she's happy about it or not, she'll do it. <clears throat> Um, okay, so uh, my privilege tonight is getting to introduce the person who will introduce our reader tonight, uh, who is the great Darcy Flatley. She'll be up here in a sec. This is, can I adjust this? Can you hear me? Should I move it? I feel weird. I don't want to mess it up. Sorry, I'm like three feet shorter than you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Hi, I first encountered Wendy Ortiz's writing through her Dreamoir Bruja. Uh, this beautiful work is a collection of Ortiz's dreams, some of which are fragmented, others spanning a few pages, but are all together languid and precise. Ortiz grounds the reader in landscapes unfamiliar but comfortable, such as this. We drove alongside a lake that was in the middle of transforming into an ocean. A tidal wave was coming at us. When our car floated gently right at the surface, we all laughed, marveling at how this could be so. As a writer, I admire the way Wendy C. Ortiz complicates the foundation of what makes a story, place, character, conflict, even truth, most notably in her memoir, Excavation, which describes a relationship between her teenage self and a school teacher. Her book hinges on the idea of excavating, digging through the past to gain better understanding. As Paul Lissicki said, it's rare to meet a memoirist who can write about the darkest things without judgment and emotional simplification. Wendy C. Ortiz is that kind of writer. Ortiz is also the author of the book Hollywood Notebook. Her prose and poetry work has been featured in the Los Angeles Times, The Rumpus, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, as well as Joyland. She lives in Los Angeles, the setting for much of her work, uh, with her family where she works as a psychotherapist. Please join me in welcoming Wendy C. Ortiz. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. This is a this is a big turnout to me. Um, I don't know if this is like just typical for you, but wow, it's really amazing to see all these people here. And I'm a little nervous about it, but. Um, I'm gonna just read to you, I'm setting my timer here just cause like I, I really have a hard time with people that go over their reading times personally. I ran a reading series for 11 years, <laughs> cannot do that. So, um, so I'm setting my timer here. I'm gonna read some excerpts from all three books um, with a super brief little intro to each one. Um, so excavation, is the story, it takes place between the ages of 13 to 18, when um, I was in a sexual relationship with my junior high teacher. Um, and I say it specifically like that, there's a reason why I describe it that way. Um, and you'll have to read the book maybe to understand more about that. So I'm just gonna start with the opening to that book. It starts in September 1986, which um, makes me 13 years old. 
The classroom was not his when he first arrived. It was the domain of substitute teachers for the first few weeks until he walked into the room. I slid into my seat and stifled a groan. There was always a silent exasperation that came with new teachers, the need to learn their likes and dislikes, their mannerisms, and what one had to do for extra credit. My back pushed into the plastic cradle of the chair. The clock arms twitched in micro movement. I winced. The teacher's desk was at an angle that faced our neat rows of desks. A cream-colored built-in cupboard behind the desk stood empty and anonymous, but contained the essence of privacy, space that the teacher would fill with teacherly possessions. Out the window across the narrow courtyard was my homeroom teacher's classroom. Mr. Connell was someone I labeled a spaz, whose wackiness and unpredictability is what kept our attention during class. I wrinkled my nose at the assignments Mr. Connell conjured up, but I avidly participated, figuring I'd trust his method of teaching to get me an A, or at the very least, a B. In front of us, though, was the new guy who'd been hired to take the reins and lead us, the advanced eighth grade English class. I could already imagine the assignments, mundane essays about summer vacation, or what we might do with a million dollars won in the California State Lottery. Pendron spirals multiplied on my notebook covers, scribbles in my hardcover textbooks, the middle section pages cluttered with my tiny handwriting messages for the student who would open it next. This teacher wore slacks and a collared shirt and tie with a dark cardigan sweater in place of a blazer. His burgundy loafers with tassels gleamed. Only one of my other male teachers dressed this way, and I was reminded that these kinds of clothes didn't occupy a place in my father's closet. While I walked between classrooms at junior high, my father was in a warehouse doing math problems, his pencil scratching graph paper before he cut sheets of metal to form ducts and casings. This work didn't require more than t-shirts, corduroys, or blue jeans, sometimes a denim apron. My mother, on the other hand, worked with and for suited men. She pushed paper, answered phones with the words, data processing, this is D, and took smoke breaks off of Sunset Boulevard where she worked on the seventh floor of a city office building. This teacher started talking to us in a fast and easy fashion, as though we were all old friends and he'd just returned from a weekend jaunt. I watched from my desk, noting his easy demeanor, how he was already joking with Brian, the class jester, and how he made eye contact with Veronica, whose attention I craved from the tip of my black boots to the top of my hairsprayed bangs. Mr. Ivers, he introduced himself, his eyes meeting ours resolutely as he spoke. His voice boomed as his thick hand composed on the blackboard, Ivers, English. Chalk dust scattered away from him like an aura. I coolly looked down at my wood top desk when he turned his attention to us, asked questions about the school, how we were doing this fine afternoon. He offered information about himself, smiling, knocking on desks with his fist, inhaling loudly. I wondered whether I wanted to look up again and watch what was suddenly sounding like fun, kids letting go of their fragile teenage seriousness the laughter catching, the banter baiting. I decided to display a disinterest I was learning to perfect. This air of disinterest took the place of thinking about school or how life with my parents felt raw, wounded. My preferred setting was the Sherman Oaks Galleria, which felt wild and thick with the comings and goings of high school dropouts turned punks, their colored hair stiffened with spray, hands outstretched awaiting change. Placing myself just outside their unpredictable orbits, I aligned myself with them and any group that was already drifting against or outside of the margins. This way, I would not be central to anything but could simply observe, absorb. Mr. Ivers, the man with a tie at the head of the class, joked with us, shared that we were his first real teaching job, but he was on to us, that he could home in on the teenage mind better than we thought. No one challenged this. It seemed plausible. His entrance to the classroom felt like instant habitation. His very being emitted energy, energy that pushed into the corners of the room, high up into the ceiling, up against the windows, daring us to take our eyes off of him and look outside. 
As soon as I found myself on the edge of my seat searching the faces of Jennifer or Tammy, both of whom were laughing and answering Mr. Ivers' questions, I remembered not interested. I leaned back into the hard frame of the chair and let my knees splay out just enough to suggest a hint of the unladylike, as my mother would call such a pose. I twirled my pencil around on the desk and kicked Abigail's desk in front of me, wanting her to join me in an active atmosphere of supreme disinterest. My eyes were dry and itchy. I pointedly glared at the clock again for effect. I considered the money in my book bag, what it might buy me if I went to the Galleria later. I didn't want to go home. Or I wanted to go home to parents who didn't fight, didn't drink, and were just normal, even though I wanted to be anything but normal. My palms lay flat, motionless, against the cool desktop. English class was in the afternoon. By that time, I had already laughed in homeroom, reapplied eyeliner in front of the bathroom mirror at nutrition break, sulked and scowled at math, and sat slack-jawed, taking careless notes through history and science. The catering trucks that served as our only lunch choice if we didn't bring our own had come and gone. It was time to master grammar, read old books, and or stare at the chalkboard as I silently sang Depeche Mode songs to myself. People are people, so why should it be? <laughs> waiting for the final bell to ring. I worked at perfecting the art of sighing, long, loud, and heavy, eyes rolled to emphasize a look of non-commitment, a careful pursing of lips and the tap of one black boot on the floor. I punctuated English class often until the day Mr. Ivers assigned us to write one creative paragraph. One creative paragraph, he said. Surely you all have papers, pens. Okay, go to it. Five minutes. Yeah, you can shoot hoops, Brian, but can you write? Yeah, a creative paragraph. Don't give me summer vacation or what you do with a million bucks. Give me one creative paragraph on anything your little hearts desire. Yep, here, paper, pen. Do you need a desk? How about a brain? Sorry, can't help you with that. Okay then, go, start it up. Start me up. His voice dissolved into an obnoxious rendition of a song I recognized as the Rolling Stones. I sighed in exasperation. I crossed my legs. My black leggings rubbed against each other. I tugged a little on the long-sleeved white-collared shirt wrapped around my waist, its arms embracing my hips, the buttons just touching my thighs. I stared at my notebook page and tentatively let the pen touch it. Then the image formed. Fire, hillsides, disaster. I ground my pen into the blank paper, curving, sloping across its face, across and back, across and back until the paragraph appeared on the page. Five minutes passed. All right, hand him up, Mr. Ivers said. Abigail turned from her seat in front of me to take my paper and shot me a look of, huh? That's it? A small sea of papers moved to the front of the class, their surfaces whispering softly against one another. Mr. Ivers collected the papers from the students in the front row, walked back to his desk, and leaned against the edge to read each paper to himself. There was a titter, then a hush, as we watched him relax into his lean, reading, flipping to the subsequent pages rather swiftly. He grunted, occasionally glancing up to say, yeah, right, looking a bashful student in the eye, or what the, directed at another. There was a strange, bouncy feeling in the air as if we were forgiven for our writing poorly, as if he was amused by our adolescent boredom and our confusion and our young, silly way of life. When he got to my paper, my throat clenched. I knew it was mine because I'd started using recycled paper, a telltale soft brown. He read my paper and paused, rereading, until I had to take a breath. Mr. Ivers looked up at me, he knows my name, I think, and asked in a low voice, as if we were the only ones in the room, Wendy, can I read this out loud? My head tilted, nodded softly. Yes, I thought to myself, too scared to say it out loud. Just get it over with. The class was quiet. They listened as he read each word slowly, words that formed an image of a fire that charged violently down a hillside to ravage the basin below. When he finished, he looked up and shook his head. Excellent, he said. This is great work. This is what I asked for. Thank you. My legs untwisted under my desk. I slouched in my seat, hid a smile, 
looked down at the haggard little etchings on my desk. I tried not to meet his eyes again that day. Mr. Ivers placed the papers in a corner of his desk and turned to begin scrawling notes on the blackboard. The class pressed on. My palms were wet and I felt unmoored. I wiped my palms on the shirt that encircled my waist with its flimsy, translucent hug. Now we're going to switch gears to Hollywood Notebook, um, which is not on the table over there. But this is the strange middle child that I like to think of. I think of it as my strange middle child. Um, so this was a, a memoir that was written, the text was written between the ages of 28 to 33, 34. Um, and then I, and all of this text was, most of this text was on a website. And then when my friend couldn't afford the website anymore, I captured all the text and put it in a Word document and just edited it over time. Um, and so this sort of is more of a, I think of it as a prose poemish memoir. Um, it's very fragmented. It sometimes has lists um, and the chapters are very short. So I'm going to read just a couple of these short chapters. Um, and this is me moving back from having left Los Angeles for eight years. I lived in Olympia, Washington, and then I moved back to Los Angeles when I was 28. For any of you astrology people out there, that is the Saturn return. <laughs> Some of you are laughing, so maybe you know what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, heavy time. Um, one. The hands smell of cigarettes, eyes red, errant hairs, tendrils on the pillow, blue pen marks on the pinky, left, an elbow in repose, toes curled under down comforter, gray matter tired, maybe lazy at this not so late hour, abandoning thoughts of turning the oven on, slipping the last cut of bread inside, butter melting on its white crispy pores, Still no cold water runs in the tap. Night quiet, tongue caressing teeth and the tobacco taste all inside. No hunger, but rather a giving up, as if all the tasks laid out are monumentally huge and cannot be undertaken, no matter deadlines, promises, or other such nonsense. Stretching, nipples hard, gray cotton shirt riding over the belly, wrists curled in writer's pose. The pose, too, of fighters, for sometimes we are both. All of the new knowledge slowly wafts by unless it can be caught hold of and respun, jagged edges alchemized into something smoother or not in the laboratory, labor being an important part of laboratory. I write from a fourth floor perch, avocado green nagahide love seat, an occasional bird staring in the direction of my window from the rooftop next door, south facing windows, a ceiling fan that gets started up around March, April, and will be in use until October if we're lucky, French press coffee, the musical car horns that parade around announcing fruits, vegetables, and women's clothing for sale from vans ambling down Kingsley Drive. That gummy-mouthed feeling takes hold. It takes hold when I'm speaking of something important, deep, the truth that fights to stay inside, only I'm pushing it out through my mouth. Scratched vocal cords, soreness, the speaking through dark clouds. My form becomes dense as wet wool, my words mashed and thickened until they escape my throat and pop into the air. It all takes on a thickness like suffocation, smoke so thick you must yell to be heard. My volume never rises. There's never any fire. Just a perpetual sinking, not unlike ocean depths that press against the lungs as every word unfolds and I speak of something unspeakable until it hits air. Three. I read Hemingway, his writing about horse racing and hunger, in between lots of sensual signposts. He writes of spring and false spring. I get off the bus, bookmark in place, the park with the artificial lake, the smell of moss, lighter than the scummy scent of the marina in Olympia, Washington. 
Hemingway wrote of fishing, the fishermen, goats, goat milk, poverty, sweatshirts as underwear. He writes of these things, and I think of S and I in our best clothes, dining at Musso and Frank on Hollywood Boulevard. The $100 dinners that set each of us back, stubbornly taken before the winter holidays. And I think of how there is no reason to demand cold running water in my apartment. I pay such low rent. I'm thrilled with my windows, the view of downtown, the proximity of palm treetops. I'm fond of the light blue carpets and black and white tiled bathroom, the 60s era refrigerator and the Formica table. I have no fireplace to roast chestnuts or throw mandarin peels. I have impeccable bowls made by friends. 59, bombs bursting in air. Sequestered in my near rooftop apartment Sunday night as people used any excuse they liked to set off explosives, pieces of plastic and other parts that whistled, sizzled, screeched. Standing on the kitchen chair in the dark, I could see bursts of light play across the sky as far away I imagine as Koreatown. Rumbles and thuds, cracks and rat-a-tat-tats blemish the sky. No sirens, no helicopters even. A strange, unreal night in Los Angeles. I've wondered why it is that I've become so skittish around fireworks the last several years. I used to be the girl in the street holding sparklers, watching her mom and dad light little red sizzling things, electric flowers that scattered then putted out, and mock rockets that shot and cried out into the night. I vividly remember walking the streets of Olympia, December 31st, 1999, that white 2 k time when we wondered what would fall and what would sustain. A group of anarchists in black roamed the streets, skipping really, and there were fireworks shot off over top of our heads and whistles piercing from nowhere, and I stepped over the detritus of low-grade explosives. My theory is, in fact, true. It was only a short month before that that I stood in the streets of Seattle, pummeled by the sounds of the crowd around us, a nervous amoeba, tear gas floating through the air, along with other poisonous additives, my chest racked with the foreign particles and fear, seeing people fall to the ground, collapse on the wet cement, trying to breathe, trying to see, while armored tanks stood their ground and leveled more threat at us from up close. The sounds I heard that night after a walk back up to the safer places for pho, Back into downtown, the heavy clack, clack, clack mimic of weapons and someone blasting Jimi Hendrix's version of the Star Spangled Banner to complete the picture I found myself running into, dodging. Small crowds of people running from large booms until someone enlightened us. It's just a sound to scare us. There's no weapon attached to that sound. And still, it's loud enough and there are enough people running that we figure it's time to get out. Nothing else to do. I stood in amazement, the stretched out cords of the electric guitar coming from seemingly nowhere. A high-rise hotel? Who would lay down a soundtrack for this night, for us? My legs tired, my body knowing that the explosions were what was forcing me back uphill even in exhaustion. My mind stuck on the scenes of people screaming and clawing at their eyes loaded with tear gas, lungs full of something meant to drive us away. This is where I ended, involuntarily, all fascination with street fireworks. This is where I began to sense the imminent war zone that could be created quickly, disturbingly, in familiar city streets. So I usually tell people that this is the daytime book of my experience between the ages of 28 to 33. This is the nighttime version, so this is the book. that I mean, all of the dreams were happening at the same time. And I took care to um, keep the same names. I changed the names of the people in my life for the books, but for the most part. But um, the same names carry over into the dreams. So there's that connection, for me at least. Um, I'm just going to tell you what a dream war is, as my publisher and I conceived of it. Um, my, actually, my, my publisher wrote this, and I was really happy that he took on creating a definition for the word dream war. A dream war is a narrative derived from the most malleable and revelatory details of one's dreams, cataloged in bold detail. A literary adventure through the boundaries of memoir, where the self is viewed from a position anchored into the deepest recesses of the mind. I was like, okay. <laughs> 
August. I drove a black truck to visit Olympia. I had cats with me. I parked outside the garage of the first place I ever mud wrestled, and when I opened the door of the truck, the cats kind of spilled out. The cats weren't mine, and I panicked. <laughs> After unloading some containers of spoiled food, pasta, fruit, lentils, a bunch of cats caroused all around my feet. I was overwhelmed trying to figure out which one was the one I was missing. Some had little tiny slips of paper on the napes of their necks where you hold them when you want them to submit to the power of the mother cat. I saw numbers and some lettering on them, but none of it told me which cat was which. They all looked exactly alike. When I found the right one, I got him into the truck cab while all the others continued brushing against my feet and calves. The United States had closed all of its borders. I was in a hotel room when I found out on the East Coast near the Canadian border. There was a government man in a blue suit charged with calming large crowds of people. He told us that we could not leave the country and in fact, we could not go anywhere but the immediate area. The crowd protested amongst itself. We could not believe this trend of events. I said aloud, perhaps we can go underwater and declare water sovereign. I was half joking. At the Canadian border, a woman read a prepared statement telling us why we could not cross. It was clear from the way she held her mouth tensely as she read that she had not written it herself. A number of us in the crowd protested her outright. In the small swell of panic, I contemplated what I would do, set fires, burn my way out of the country. On my way to school in Portland, I saw my professor, Michael Moore, at a bus stop. <laughs> when I showed up late for the test, he came over to my desk and showed me the many-paged exam with lots of his pen marks on it. He told me I was late and he didn't know if I could finish the test. I looked up at him. I know I'm late, I said. They surrounded the bus stop I always leave from with orange cones and the bus was late, making my trip to school two hours long. He put the exam on my desk. I carried a large backpack, the one I take traveling, and in it was my light blue uniform from Catholic school. I had to change into it, and did, covertly, for Michael Moore's class. <laughs> also in my backpack was a bomb. <laughs> it looked like a car battery, only instead of a digital readout showing the countdown, it resembled an old-fashioned gas station readout, numbers that rolled into the next number. I had about four minutes to place the bomb somewhere it could safely detonate and not hurt anyone. I wasted 90 seconds trying to figure out where to take it. I jumped into a non-motorized vehicle and drove off under the cloudy sky. When I found an elementary school set back in the woods, I knew I'd found the right spot. I walked right through the empty classrooms to the backyard, past the playground where I spotted a deep marsh. It would be best to leave the bomb there. It could create a sinkhole, and I might avoid taking any lives. I left it in the marsh and mud and walked quickly back through the classrooms. The classrooms now had teachers in them who eyed me as I moved to exit. I knocked over someone's glass of iced tea. Sorry, I said, and left the building. <laughs> I didn't realize I had a serious cut in the bottom of my foot until I walked down the carpeted stairs of the unfamiliar house. I left a trail of thick blood in my wake. I sat down in a chair and looked at the bottom of my foot. In the most tender part was a gash and the blood wouldn't stop flowing. Sharon Olds helped me clean up the cut. Her manner was gentle, mothering. I grimaced and squealed in her hands with the feel of the liquid she used stinging my open wound. <laughs> October. I gave birth to a baby girl. I was at my mother's house. I was dressed in a white half slip and long sleeved white silk shirt. A cat asked me if I would nurse her. <laughs> I knew it was weird. 
I looked around. I could find a private place. I said yes. In my childhood bedroom, I situated the cat on one breast and the little girl on the other. I called the little girl Lupita. Thank you. This is a Q&A now. <laughs> committed to writing it as memoir, as something true that had happened, I spent a lot of time fictionalizing it. And sometimes it wouldn't even be the actual story, but some of the characters. And it was like I was trying to work out what had happened. And, and I was doing it in fiction because it felt safer to me. Um, so. I, I mean, I started trying to write that story probably like around, well, I mean, really, I started writing that story while it was happening, right? But I actually wrote a novel when I was 14 that is just bizarre. And it, so yeah, I did try to write it. But from the time that I actually decided that I was going to write it as the true thing that it was, um, it took all of my 20s. It took all of my 20s. And then once I had like a draft, like a real draft, it, I, I was like 28. So it took, it took many forms and incarnations. And it just, then it was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is, I have to do this for my MFA program. I have to write something. So it's going to be this. Um, but, it went through so many weird incarnations. It, it, I was just speaking to a class and I was talking about how initially it was so abstract and I was, I think, dreaming really of being a poet. And so I was like, it was very poetic and very sensory and sometimes that obscured the actual story, but that also felt, made it safer to write about. Um, so, yeah, it, it took many, many years. So I usually, if people ask me like the, you know, how long did it, the whole thing take? I usually say 14 years, but seriously, it's more than 14 years. It's more than 14 years, because it started really while it was happening, that I was writing about it. It's a long time. I have a similar question regarding the form process. Like how long did it take for you to write Ruhab? Because it's a collection of dreams, but I don't believe you, or maybe, I don't know, if you like remember all of your dreams like every single day, but I'm yeah, just curious about that. So, um, I, so my friend had given me, this was before we called things blogs. My friend had given me website space, and I had these two different website spaces. One of them I reserved purely for writing my dreams, and I was inspired by, um, in Harper's Magazine, there's this section that is like, they're just pulling from all these different sources, and there was a, uh, I can't remember what that section is called. Findings, thank you. And there was one that was always really funny and inspiring to me, and it was like they'd taken a zine somebody had written, and it was their dreams written as though they were report, reported news stories. <laughs> and there's no mention of the word dream, and I was really inspired by that. So I was keeping these dreams that I remembered on this website. And then I, and then when the website was going to go down, I just grabbed all the text. And then over the years, would just drop in and edit it whenever I felt like I wanted to. But at that point in time, I was remembering my dreams on a regular basis. For many, many years, I did remember my dreams on a regular basis. And I tried to write them down as often as possible. But that time, it was like, for this website, so I was like, nobody was reading it. But I was like excited to like put it there every time and to try and experiment with how to make it sound like 
yeah, this happened. This isn't a dream. And never using the word dream as sort of a constraint. So the editing of it is a whole other story. But that's, you know, I was just keeping those dreams, um, keeping the dates. The dates got removed from the book because they're not that important. There's only months listed there now. But yeah, so it's several years worth of dreams, of, you know, four or five years. Um, Yes, you said the editing part of it was a whole other story. I'm so interested in how editing dreams might be different than editing regular materials. It's so weird. You know, also you have to go through the thing of like, there are, you know, there are people that are like, I don't want to ever hear about your dreams, right? There are people in this room who are like, don't talk to me about your dreams, right? But that's not me. I love when people talk about their dreams. Like, that's one of my favorite things. In fact, I'm always like, why don't we have a genre called dream noir? I want to read the dreams of all of the, the writers I admire, frankly. So why not do that, you know? Um, so, but editing it is so weird and so hard because I wanted each one to be a story. And I wanted it to look a certain way on the page. And I, so editing it is, was really tricky. Like, what is going to be interesting to people? I don't know. Like, it may be funny to me, and maybe it's not funny to anybody else. But you know, it was nice to hear some laughs here. Because sometimes I think when I read from that book, people are just like, "What?" <laughs> and they don't know whether or not to laugh sometimes. Um, so it's it's it took a lot of time, and I had to I had to really rely on my editors to help me go. Like, does this like is this an interesting enough dream? Like, is this something that should be included? Like, how do you edit out dreams? Like, what's the, I don't know. I mean, like, I literally was like, well, these seem important to me. They do speak to something in my daily life experience. Like, all of the mentions of Olympia, for example. Um, I was very much at the time grieving having left Olympia. So that, to me, was like a thread that was all, all the dreams about Olympia I wanted to have in the book. Um, and certainly dreams, this was a very stressful time, so there were many tsunami dreams and um, cataclysmic earthquake dreams and those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, I would, it's a really hard thing to edit. I, I want people to do it, and then you can see how hard it is. Because <laughs> how do you make it interesting for people? It's hard. Exactly. And that's what I love about this because it's not fiction or nonfiction. <laughs> and that's yeah, that's one of the things I love about it. Um, but I did not technically fictionalize, I didn't change anything because that would have felt really inauthentic to me. Um, there's nothing that I changed except for names. But I had to, but still it was like this weird, like it felt like this surgery almost to like go in and say, okay, how do I make this dream look like a standalone story with such, you know, there's, sometimes they're so short. So how do I do that? So I'm like, there's nothing that got fictionalized, but I may have like added a sentence just to make something transition better because you know in dreams nothing is going to transition fluidly and sometimes it's funnier when it doesn't but I had to keep I, it was important to me to keep everything as real as possible because it's, yeah it's unreal <laughs> but I think of it as my if that was my nightlife these are the kinds of dreams that that I would wake up the next day and feel tired I feel like I had been like on the move all night long. You know, do you know those dreams? I don't have dreams like that anymore. So I don't know. But I remember always waking up and just being like, my God, I like lived a whole other life. <laughs> so that's what was happening at that time. So it felt like there was enough to keep it a momentum there. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to track your dreams? Because I've tried and then in the morning the note is like lettuce. 
and it's really disappointing. The note, the, what do you find in the morning? Mm -hmm. Just like one random word that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I used to do all kinds of things because, you know, sometimes you don't have time to wake up and like go into your dream, you know, you just don't have time. So I would do things like, if there were a couple of standout images, and the one that I always think of, because it made it into this book, is a dream that I had where um, I saw a big block of tofu <laughs> and a bunch of cockroaches coming out of it. Yeah, how could you forget that, right? So, but it was like all day long. I didn't have time to like sit down and write out the whole thing. So I remember that day when I went to work, I would keep repeating the words over. I was like, tofu and cockroaches. <laughs> Just to like keep it going, because otherwise it's gone. And now I cannot, I mean, I don't know, I think probably an age thing now, I cannot keep dreams at all. Like I just, they don't happen like that. It doesn't work anymore. So I don't know if I have suggestions other than like really just trying, like capturing whatever you can. Hopefully it's more than one word because you need something to hinge it on. But sometimes the one word will be enough that reminds you of the whole thing. Um, I, would, I wouldn't do anything like fancy. I would really just wake up and like try and write down, and it's like always looks terrible scribble. <laughs> but like I would just try and write down whatever I could remember. And then if I could, didn't have time to do that, I would just keep repeating those words and all day long until I could write it down. Uh, I was wrong, it's not findings, it's readings. It's readings, readings. yes, readings. Uh, Thank you. How much of your psychotherapy practice, like, like, in that kind of training, did you use for the dream, like in the recording or the, or the shaping, or mm -hmm. like, which ones are, like, and like, how does it even fit into your practice, like, what do you think of these guys? Like, uh -huh. Or was it all writing? You know, so I'm thinking, like, when I was deeply editing this book, I must have still been an intern. Um, and was also seeing a Jungian analyst before, I saw a Jungian analyst before the heavy editing of this book. So I was, yeah, so I had like decided, I'm gonna, you know, you, that's something that you really, that's a commitment. <laughs> going to the Jungian analyst. And so, um, really it was there that like, it was like, oh, this is all the sessions. Like, you're not, like, in fact, Regular psychotherapy for 10 years, in my, for my experience, helped prepare me for Jungian analysis because analysis is not therapy. It is something totally different. And um, I was just thinking like, oh, I'm just gonna go try out like a you know, different therapist because I'm an intern and like I wanna get to know how people work. And I'm into Jung and da da da. And it's just like a really deep, weird different experience where like I could just come in and be like I had this dream and she'd be like you know let's go right into it you know and I was like wow okay so this is this is what we do so that I think had played a part too um whether consciously or unconsciously that was just it, it was a really good foundation I think in when it came to editing now, as a therapist, I love when people, like, I don't, I don't ask people to bring me their dreams, but if they bring it up, I'm always like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's, let's do it. And, um, and, and I usually use the same sorts of, um, the same kinds of ways that my analyst worked with me to look at the dreams, um, which is just very easy. It's just like, you know, all the characters in your dream are some facet of you. And if you look at it that way, as opposed to like, you know, I know that sometimes we have dreams where something really traumatic happens with somebody we love and you wake up and it's like, oh my gosh, that didn't really happen, but you have to keep reminding yourself that didn't really happen. Um, but what if that was just some part of you? And if so, what part of you is it and why is it, you know, just getting curious about it as opposed to being like, oh my gosh, I can't touch that because it's too painful or weird or, you know, scary. Um, so I have fun now <laughs> talking with clients about their dreams with that kind of framework um, and thinking of the dreams that I can remember of my own still, thinking of it in that framework. 
Um, but I, but at, when I was editing this book, I wasn't thinking so much about that. I think I really was focused on how, how do each of these dreams, like what is interesting about each of these dreams that I want to like kind of zero in on and would be interesting to a reader. Because I recognize that not everybody likes dreams or wants to talk about them. Mm -hmm. How has being a psychotherapist um, affected your writing, and how has, or and vice versa, mm -hmm. has it helped? Has it hurt? How would you? Because you're kind of straddling different worlds. Yeah. So, how do you balance them, etc.? I don't know how to balance them. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, I keep. I, I'm. I, I can be a little rigid in a lot of ways. And I feel rigid about having these separate careers. My psychotherapy career is its own thing. I don't advertise, for instance, on my website for psychotherapy that I'm the author of these books. I do say that I am a published writer because I believe that there are people who might want to seek me out because they want that for themselves or they identify as artists and that will be appealing and maybe make them feel like, oh, she's somebody that maybe I can learn something from or you know, she'll understand some of the things that I'm going through. But I don't get specific ever about what I write about or anything like that. So I, that's my own feeling of like, I'm gonna keep this separate. Of course there are people that will figure out that, oh, wait, my therapist wrote this book. That has happened, and I cannot control that. It is super weird, though, to be a psychotherapist writing memoir, because, um, yeah, and the internet, you know? It's like, anybody could look me up, and, you know, I do, I do these silly things that, in my mind, are like, this is gonna keep the separation. Like, for psychotherapy, I actually don't include my middle initial. For all of my writing, I include the middle initial. And so oh, an internet search will show up different things, you know, like. And I do have plenty of clients who have, like, no interest in writing. So it works out fine, you know. They're not looking for that stuff on the web. Um, so I would say, though, that the, the psychotherapy work, one thing that I really love that I feel like it sort of feeds my writing, and my writing feeds how I work as a psychotherapist. When I even decided to go into this field, it was because I knew someone who was a visual artist who went into um, the psychology field, and she had said, this work is really feeding like my, my visual art. And I was like, of course, of course, of course. And that's when I was like, oh, Maybe, maybe this is something for me to look into. And I had never thought about it before. I had a therapist, my first therapist was always like, have you ever thought about becoming a therapist? And I was always like, no. Like you're just sitting with people all day listening to their problems, that sounds terrible. And I didn't understand what it meant. You know, I was very young and I just didn't get it. And over time, I think I, I got to a place where I was like, whoa, this is actually a really fascinating interesting field and I love it turns out I love this work thank goodness um, so because there's a lot of time and energy and money that goes into that but so I, I guess I kind of feel in my mind they are somewhat separate but I also am aware that they feed each other in many ways it's like I get to sit with people and listen to stories all day you know like that's amazing and then I get to like hold their hold their secrets and like, thank goodness I'm not like a fiction writer because I feel like it would be like, I would constantly want to like write some story. I don't feel that at all. I'm never, I'm never like, ooh, I wish I could get this into a story. I mean, I'm frequently fascinated by clients, but like it's never, I hold that so strongly, that line, that confidentiality line, like, so it doesn't impact me that way. It just feels like a really great use of my time. I get to know people deeply. And that, I mean, I need to know that for writing.
Um, along those lines, when do you make time for writing and how do you fit that into your day? Week? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I, I was just, when I was speaking to the class a little while ago, I was talking about how after I had my kid, who's now eight, I wrote more than I ever did before, which is goes against what everybody says, like you have a kid and you suddenly don't have, you know, yeah, those things are true, but also it can like create this really weird disciplined time. Um, so I wrote more after she was born than I ever did because I suddenly was like, oh my God, I only have this much time, I've gotta do with it. And it just felt the urgency was like there. I don't feel quite like that so much anymore um, so finding time, making time, it's so hard. I try not to be precious about like, oh, I need to feel like a certain way or I need to like have a certain, you know, whatever to write. No, I, I can't do that, but it's, it's a challenge still all the time. I don't always want to sit down and write. So it feels pretty elusive to me right now and it changes and that's the other thing is like, it's constantly shifting and changing how like how I find the time, how I do the balance. Right now, I, I'm i like trying to do a genre that I've never done before and that's like taking up my time and headspace and it's exciting but I also just like, well, you know, do I, how much time do I have? Do I wanna spend my time doing that? So I, right now, it's, it's elusive, I, I don't know. I don't know how I'm doing it. <laughs> After doing the uh, three more, what, what takeaways did you have about Fabidi, about the writing process in general? Did it change your writing process, do you think? I don't know if it changed my writing process so much, but it was a, it felt like a really hard exercise to go through. And like using a really strange constraint, um, which to me was like that was the fun of it, but um, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> I, you know, like doing that was so specific that I don't know that I want it to like impact my process anymore. Because it, it, like I said, it was just like going in and like zeroing in and being like, okay, this fragment, I've got to like somehow make into a story. How do I do that? You know, and it's, it's really hard. So I, and I don't feel like I'm a fiction writer. I try, but it doesn't it doesn't work for me. I don't know, I can't I can't do it. So I don't think it really has. I, I feel like I don't want it to. <laughs> I um, I heard you uh, at Skylight Books about a year ago, uh, as part of the group of you were talking about publishing with independent presses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could just share with like some of the students how you found those independent presses that published your work. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so as I, I'm gonna try and make this a brief story because it is like such a weird, long, rambling story. But, um, so I had initially an agent who um, tried to sell excavation. And the reason I even got that agent was because of a modern love column. And I'm just gonna say, if you ever write a modern love column, you better have that book ready. You better have it because agents like start contacting you as soon as it's published and they're like, where's the book? And you have to have a book. I had excavation. I was working on it as I had been working on it for many, many years. And so when agents contacted me after the modern love column got published, um, and they were like, where's the book based on this column? I was like, I don't have it, but I have this. And so then I really was like, oh my God, I better keep working on this book. And, um, and the agent that I got was not a good fit. Um, but also the, the beauty of it was that I got all of the, she, she sent it out to all of the big publishers and I, I asked to see all of the comments. So I have all of that. I have all of the rejections which is a really wonderful exercise if you ever get into that place. Like it's a really, it actually is really good. It's painful, but it's good. Um, and the refrain was constantly like, we love this writing, but it's too dark. It's too, the content is like, we don't know how we are gonna market this. And it, luckily, 
I had written an encapsulated version of excavation in a kind of strange essay called Mixtape that got published on a website called The Nervous Breakdown, where <laughs> my publisher was reading and he reached out to me and was like, hey, do you have anything? Do you have a manuscript or anything? And I was like, yes, my agent's trying to sell this. She's not having any luck. And he was like, can I look at it? Yes, gave it to him. He was like, all right, I wanna publish this next year. And I was like, oh my God. So that was my first introduction to small press. I was familiar with him and his press because um, this was Future Tense Books in Portland. I had lived in Olympia for many years and our paths, while not, we hadn't crossed in real life, we, I'd heard of his name, I'd heard of this publisher, I admired some of the work that he had already published. So that's how he and I found each other. And then, um, strangely, before even that happened, I had reached out to a small press about Hollywood Notebook. And it was important to me at the time that it be a small press based in Los Angeles. I knew that this book is not a commercial book. It's like so weird. It's not anything an agent, you know, I'm aware, no agent is gonna wanna try and sell a prose poemish memoir, not when I'm an unknown person. So it was important to me to approach a local press because it was about living in Hollywood. I knew a press that was, they were like mostly doing really interesting literary projects, not necessarily books, but I really respected and admired them. And I just reached out. They said, we don't take submissions. And I reached out anyway. And they were like, okay, sure, let's take a look. And then they said that they would publish it. And it was supposed to be the first book, but because there's small press, like sometimes it works really fast and sometimes it works really slow with small press. So they ended up taking longer, making it my second book, which I'm so relieved about because I think that the order worked out much better. The excavation came first. So that's how Hollywood Notebook happened. And then another small press like reached out to me and was like, hey, do you have any innovative fiction? And I was like, oh my God, I don't, I don't write fiction. But, that, but it, then I was like, oh my God, I have this manuscript, I have like this text. At the time, I didn't think of it as a manuscript. It was like, I have all of this text of these dreams that I've been wanting to do something with. This is fiction, but it's not fiction. This is innovative fiction. So I was like, I was like, well, I've got this thing. And he was like, oh my God, perfect. Let's run with this. And he came up with a dream work definition you know I was like I luckily I was like all right yes this is a dream war and he was like okay let's define that and it, it just it worked out so well because we were on the same page about it um, so I was happy with how that happened so that and that's unusual I think just like it was year it was three books in three years which is super weird but um, and who knows when the other book will happen but that that was how I got involved with small presses, and certainly they all talk to each other. We're all in the same communities, so it's like, I know, I, it's like I feel connected to so many small presses, and I think that, um, yeah, that kind of helps make it happen. I think that moment of silence <laughs> ends it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming out. Don't forget we have books in the back uh, that you can buy and uh, when you'll be here to sign. The bar is open. Enjoy. Uh, we're back next year, although later this uh, semester there's a Major Writers Festival too, which are in April. So long.